right. So thanks, guys, for joining. Another very interesting couple weeks. Um, I think there are more updates from you than there are from me, so I'm going to just move really quickly through them. Uh, just reminding everybody um, that uh, the Milestones page uh, is here, um, so uh, reminding folks to close issues as they go, but I've seen a lot of closed issues already this uh, in, in the last few days, in fact, so um, I think that that, uh, that that seems to be working well. Um, all right, a um, couple other updates. So there is uh, a new neuroinformatics meeting coming up. Uh, it is on uh, the, the deadline to submit an abstract is, uh, was originally the 8th, so uh, I was a little worried we were going to miss it because it didn't pop up on my radar quickly enough. But happily, it's been extended to April 29th. Um, the meeting is being held in Stockholm in August, and uh, there's some interesting uh, attendees, uh, not the least of which this guy here talking about the Brain Initiative, um, and, uh, which I'll say a little bit about later. And, and uh, well, you can kind of look through the, through the list here, but this meeting always tends to be at the center of uh, you know, the, the topics that interest us the most. So um, I think we should consider, and, and maybe not take up too much time right now, but we should consider what we could uh, report by the time uh, that, that comes along. So um, maybe at the end of the updates, uh, if we have time, we should pick around some topics. Otherwise, I may uh, dragoon some of you into uh, you know, piecing the next bits of this. We can start a thread on the discuss list and yeah. kick, kick around ideas there. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, Hi, Andre, by the way. Uh, can't see your video yet, but uh, good to see you're in. Um, the uh, link to the uh, agenda is there. OK. So um, that's the first thing. Um, then uh, on the list, you guys probably saw uh, what we started talking about at the end of the last meeting, that this uh, LSI, um, or I guess, uh, sorry, FPGA-based uh, hardware implementation of C. Elegans project uh, reached out to us. Uh, they first, we reached out to them on Twitter uh, last week and then, or two weeks ago, and then they've, they've sent this, uh, this email. So I think it's great that we're um, having that open communication on the, on the discussion list. And um, you know, thanks, thanks for Mike for engaging them uh, on, on some questions. Hopefully we'll hear back from them soon. But uh, just from the, the thread that they sent, it looks like there's already um, you know, good complementary, um, you know, complementary work that uh, that both communities can, can focus on. So I'm really excited about that. Um, my more significant update, I guess, from this last couple of weeks, just in terms of the broader landscape, um, I've had two conversations now with uh, the lab of Terry Sanofsky. Uh Terry Sanofsky is um, one of the best published. Um, principal investigators, researchers, professors in the field of computational neuroscience. Um, he's the head of the graduate program that I joined, actually, at UCSD. Um, so he has this lab at the Salk Institute, and he's one of the principal uh, folks behind the, uh, the scientific direction of the Brain Initiative, um, which I'll say a little bit more about later. There's no formal relationship or connection to it yet, but um, I spent um, about three or four hours sitting down with um, one of their lead so, um, scientist engineers uh, named Tom Bartle, really, really bright guy, really talented, has been there um, in the lab for um, a very long time, so he's kind of one of the core people. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that they do there, just, so that, just as an eye towards thinking about, you know, where the future might go um, and, and to think about, you know, some of these integrations. Uh, none of this is anything, I think, we can leap on immediately because we're kind of, uh, I think we have our work cut out for us just to get to the end of this release cycle in, in June, but um, but maybe for the next one, I just kind of want you to, to know informationally. So um, this, uh, this is kind of the starting point, and um, they have a Google Code site for this uh, thing they call Cell Blender, which is an add-on to Blender that enables the creation of um, of simulations that plug into mCell. Um, there's also some partial support for SBML. 
Um, if you're not familiar with MCEL, um, it is a Monte Carlo-based simulation for uh, simulation system for um, channels and molecules diffusing. Uh, it basically is a system for taking space inside cells in, into account at a very high level of resolution. So with this system, you actually basically are working at the subcellular level, actually uh, having positions of uh, the individual channels marked, um, having the kinetics of reactions uh, simulated as part of its work. Um, and so what's nice is that um, that right that it used to have a um, it's kind of been undergoing a process of uh, coming f uh, from uh, academic an, an academic internal project that um, wasn't very visible to the outside world um, and it's uh, transforming itself into a much more open project and uh, they have s continued support for cell blender uh, moving forward um, in the next uh, three or four or five years um, I know immediately you're going to ask you're going to ask me if uh, there's a Python library for M cell. Uh, there isn't yet, but they are in the process of building a lib M cell. Um, there is a C library, but they uh, want to build a sort of a Pi uh, M cell library down the road, um, and that's an interesting you know intersection point uh, you know for us when, when we start thinking about diffusion and when we start thinking about uh, some of the subcellular pieces. But the cell blender part. Um, is available now and uh, works now, um, and they're continuing to build on it. But the source is is here, um, and so um, I guess uh, what would be nice is if there were um, if there was sort of a walkthrough or a movie, um, which is not available here. But um, we can I, we can go into more detail on it offline. But essentially, what it does is it takes Blender and uh, and adds to it um, a layer where you, you can import a mesh very much like the three-dimensional uh, shapes that we have for the C. elegans. And then you, it has ways to select regions of meshes and then define what um, receptors should go where, or synapse uh, positions. Uh, but synapse positions actually defined as a mesh, not as just a, a point. So um, they also are talking about doing you know, M-cell neuron integration. This has actually been an ongoing project. Uh, some of you uh, from the NeuroML world, you know, may be aware of of, of this uh, in, in the past, but um, it's going to continue to increase. And given Terry's involvement to some extent with with the Brain Initiative, I have a feeling that these kinds of approaches will, um, you know, will continue to be uh, of interest. Um, I do want to share with you um, a video that hit YouTube that uh, was built using MCell. And it's actually. Oh yeah, there you are. Okay, here's the link. Uh, you can you can watch on your own. Um, let me set it up through YouTube here. Now let's see if it actually works. No. Okay, right. The YouTube plugin when I log in through this is is, is kind of messed up. But um, have a look through this uh, this movie. And uh, what you'll see is that the nice thing, obviously, about having this plugged into Blender is that they can, in addition to uh, des describing their simulation, they can also make nice movies of, uh, you know, different pieces of tissue. And, uh, and so um, what this movie doesn't show you probably so clearly is the part where um, particles are actually diffusing through this block of tissue. But uh, they have that as well. And... Uh, there was a, I think two years ago, Neuroinformatics, Terry Sanofsky spoke, and he showed, uh, he shared this movie that was created with the, these, these tools and technologies. So anyway, that's just sort of a relationship building thing. As always, if you have any questions or want to connect more tightly with this or are more curious about it, um, I can connect you, uh, you know, with, with Tom Bartle and the lab. We're both kind of on the lookout for folks to work across the two projects. I showed him Open Worm. They're very excited about it. They really think the approach that we're taking is, is very interesting, very complementary to some of the things that they want to do. And as always, the, the, the matter is, is really just that there's not enough time uh, for, for folks to you know, engage. So I think the more that we're aware of what they're doing um, and when we start thinking about neuropeptides and actually simulating neuropeptides, this would be a system to look at um, for, for carrying out those aspects. So. Um, any questions on that before I move?
Um, yeah, out of interest, how did this conversation start? Did you contact them? And I'm just interested to know how. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a follow-on from conversations I've had with Tom since uh, since I've been a graduate student. So um, back being graduate student, the lab that I was in at that point already had a a, a great collaboration with Terry's lab. I also rotated in Terry's lab as a as a graduate student myself the first uh, quarter I was there. So I met I met all those guys at that point. And uh, really, it was, uh, I haven't checked in with them at all about Open Worm um, for quite a while. And we always, we like see each other, but we haven't like checked in. So I finally just took the time to send the email and say, hey, we should sit down. We should share, uh, you know, what we're both doing, uh, which we finally did. And so that's basically, and it seemed like a good timing as well, uh, just as, you know, Terry was back in okay. the news, uh, and sort of more public, kind of where they're, where they're going. So that's, uh, yeah, that's where that's going. There is actually um, a, I don't think, I don't know if folks will uh, will necessarily be available for it, but there is a um, instructional session on MCEL happening um, in May um, that could be interesting, just informational purposes, if folks want to send it around. Um, where they're going to be training people on MCEL and, and what it's about. So um, registration open for the new MCEL workshop. So here, this link, that's uh, that's a workshop that's happening in May that he mentioned. Um, it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at, uh, I guess, uh, University of Pittsburgh. And, and uh, yeah, University of Pittsburgh. Right. And, and so that uh, looks like the looks like the application deadline is already passed. So that may not be happening, but uh, um, anyway, there are. It looks like there are some references to check out, and they are creating a new manuscript to describe some of the cell blender stuff, which should be coming out soon. Um, so anyway, just for informational purposes, this uh, uh, it's a good way to tie into some of the high performance computing folks and others in computational science. Okay, uh, let me keep going because, again, I, I think uh, I really want to just hand this over to you guys. All right, so thoughts about the brand initiative. Um, had some questions about it already from some of you, um, and I thought I'd just sort of make some comments right now. Um, obviously, um, it's been big news. Um, things that are interesting and relevant to us from my perspective, one, that Terry's involved, so I already kind of mentioned that. Um, another that's interesting is that Corey Bargman, who is um, considered to be one of the top C. elegans researchers, biologist researchers, um, is also driving it, um, which is very interesting. And um, so between the computational neuroscience interests of Terry and the C. elegans interests of Corey, one might imagine that, uh, that, that the C. elegans starts to see some love. Um, that being said, I don't have any formal connections to any of the planning processes myself. I'm speculating, just as you are, um, about what's what's going to happen. I know that uh, if you're if you're a wonk and you're following the um, ins and outs of this, uh, just because the president says he wants to do it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, with American separation of, of powers, uh, Congress has to approve it, and the way they do that is by approving the budget that uh, he sent to Congress. He sent that to Congress last week, um, and uh, and the politics are flying around the budget as a whole. Um, so depending on who you ask, folks are optimistic about this particular piece passing. Um, others are, you know, don't have any comment. So we'll see, but it won't officially kick off until that gets through. I think it will. I think it's hard to hard to shut down something that has this much publicity around it. But you know. Um, so anyway. Um, I think, though, it's interesting to note that um, you know the level of funding is less than what you what you saw come out of Europe with the Human Brain Project. So folks are speculating that you know that there may be maybe harder to get some things done. The other thing that is interesting is that as of yet, I don't I haven't heard of a centralized. There's no centralized <clears throat> single site where the planning is going to come out of. So it is being done as a seems to be as a partnership between multiple groups that all have to coordinate with each other. Um, so it'll be interesting to see who is 
deemed to be kind of the, the top of the, the leadership in that. Uh, and, and also the goals of it, I think, a lot of folks have commented on are still coming out in terms of what the focus will be. Right now it appears to be kind of a grab bag of technologies. And I haven't heard a lot of talk about um, what the computational methods are going to be that come out of it. So uh, a lot of that I've heard are experimental methods, um, pushing imaging forward, pushing measurements forward, um, abilities to take measurements of, of all sorts of different um, things. There's this clear brain clearing technology that we heard about recently that may uh, you know get some support potentially. But uh, that's kind of what I've heard so far. Um, if there is obviously if there is a way to connect to it, um, I will I will do my best to do that. Um, but at the same time, you know we you know we have to continue on um, you know with the direction that we have, um, and um, and so we can't you know change things radically for something like this. But um, I'm hoping that with greater emphasis on things at the subcellular level, um, connecting with you know Terry's group over time, uh, potentially there'll be a way that we can at least you know have access to understanding what's going on, if not sort of um, you know sort of greater support. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> um, thanks for the definition, Mike. Uh, OK, so does anybody else uh, want to say something about that? I thought I'd actually just open this up for commentary, since this group might have some interesting perspectives on, uh, on the Brain Initiative, or may have heard things um, in your neck of the woods that, that I haven't. Um, to me, it's the more I read about it, the more I get confused, actually. I'm still not exactly clear, sort of, I suppose it's not surprising, but I'm, I'm still not exactly clear, sort of, what it is. I mean, there's a lot of articles about it, but the message I seem to get, seem to get is there's going to be <clears throat> a significant amount of money put towards, <clears throat> put towards neuroscience and connectomes in particular. But any, any, I, it, there seems to be, it seems to be a bit thin on the detail, at least in the news. Is that? Am I the only one with that uh, impression, or? Nope. Yeah. We're all in the same. Boat. <clears throat> but I got the impression that uh, the initial batch of money is is enough for the first year or so to actually set the goals for a much larger initiative. Um, I don't know. So what I've heard is 100 million over 10 years. Um. But uh, I don't know if, money. if that's going to get increased. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, um, if, that's taken, if that's taken out of other programs as well and put into one big pot, which is 100 million, I mean, that's a fraction of NIH and any of the that's other budgets for neuroscience. Right. So, so we'll see. I mean, I, I think this is, this is what lots of folks um, are, are saying right now. Um, there was actually I was just seeing the other night. Um, let me link you to uh, there's a there's a good uh, discussion on Quora about it. It's some of the uh, yeah here. Um, there's some interesting so some folks on Quora have have a good um, breakdown of it. The guy Josh Siegel uh, who's got the top answer um, has some good points about um, so. I think every everybody is kind of just waiting to see. I think that uh, even the people involved have yet to have a formal planning process. Prior to it being announced as the Brain Initiative, we heard about something called a Brain Activity Map, which is getting kicked around, and then that changed uh, in the final announcement by Obama, obviously. So folks are trying to speculate to what the connection between a Brain Activity Map is and this, or what that would even mean. Um, so basically, watch this space. Stay tuned. Um, we'll see. Uh, as it goes and as it evolves, um, as I hear things, obviously, uh, I'll, I'll put it out. And we'll also be watching, you know, the Twitter feed uh, and uh, you know, Google Plus. So, um, you know, if you're not following our own Twitter account or our own Google Plus account, you should, because we tend to we tend to, you know, share out updates that we get immediately there, um, so that uh, folks can begin to know. Um, okay. Uh, anybody else want to say anything about it? Um, I was at the um, INC yeah, uh, Nodes workshop meeting for the last two days in I, Stockholm. 
where the uh, representative from each of the national nodes of the INCF get together. Um, and one of the points they made there was that they're trying to develop close relationships with the Human Brain Project, uh, Brain Initiative, One Mind for Research, and I think there was one other one. But uh, they were attempting to be a kind of a facilitate communication between these uh, groups. So, um, yeah, I mean, that may be a point where by uh, these type of initiatives get talking to each other and a place where openness and standardization gets promoted into these, but we'll see what happens. Sure hope so. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Stephen should take a lead on keeping an eye on all these initiatives, and you seem to be the most sort of <clears throat> politically astute of us. So, um, well, there's 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 a lot of us that are kind of watching these these spaces, and mm -hmm. a lot of good folks to talk to. But um, I uh, I do I do end up talking to a lot of folks, so mm. um, I will uh, I will let you know as much as possible. I think the best thing for the Brain Initiative, honestly, would be if it were carried out as an open science initiative. Um, I think that uh, having an open mailing list to discuss it and to set, you know, its goals would be really powerful. Um, I, uh, you know, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, but um, um, if I know things, I'll let you know. And uh, you know, just similarly find things out. Get to the person on the list. All right. Okay. Um, so, okay, um, I spoke with uh, Balash also uh, recently. He's, uh, he's gotten some feedback on the perspective article uh, from his advisor, and we're going to hear back from a couple other folks, but I'm wanting to push this out as soon as we can. So um, we have another check-in point, I think, next week uh, to discuss um, making some additional edits. Um, you can also see that he's uh, posted on the discuss list. I think that the information that uh, that Ev shared with us about the uh, worm behavior uh, database was of interest to him. And he said that it, uh, it was causing him to think some things, not that he was going to revise the, the entire manuscript, but that uh, he wanted to have some way to at least cite and include uh, references to that work because he got it result in uh, the Turing test stuff, which I think we all probably, those of us involved in that discussion probably could see that there would be a connection there. So um, so he's he's trying to find a way to incorporate that, and, um, and I'm thinking of doing it. Do you know what kind of feedback you got? Um, I didn't, he didn't go into the details with me, um, but uh, he, he said his, uh, his advisor was generally supportive. He'd given a small talk about Open Worm in the project at a, at a lab retreat. <clears throat> Basically, sort of kicking around the idea. Um, I think there were some, you know, some edits offered, but yeah, I, I don't have specifics on it. Um, we should, um, I mean, basically, when the next draft is ready, I think we'll send it around to everybody again and have a look. So that uh, and Meta Cohen didn't get back. Um, I have not heard yet that she has gotten back, but uh, but she she initially responded positively that she would be happy to to review it. I think. When I heard last, you just hadn't had a chance to yet. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Well, uh, that does it for me then. Let's move on to you guys. There's been a lot of activity on GitHub, so um, it's even been hard for me to follow it all. But uh, but I did see an awesome movie, uh, which we'll get to uh, with Mike. But first, let's start with uh, Giovanni. Uh, okay. All I did since last time, I tried to do one last push to finish this porting of the SPH stuff into the Java version. I did. I was happy with the, the amount of stuff that I was able to get done, basically finish the porting. But then uh, there was a cold shower <laughs> when I tried to run uh, the Elastic scene with strange stuff happens and uh, the Elastic Matter uh, explodes. <laughs> Which is something that I heard from the guys before, but I had, uh, actually have no idea what was going on. I didn't get the chance to actually find out, and it's not as simple as oh, let's find out what's wrong. It's like I'm gonna 
have to run the original and the ported version side by side and look at the buffers and look at the numbers just to figure out uh, where it diverges. Um, I'm fairly confident that all the code is there. I might. It's not excluded that I introduce some bugs when I ported uh, the stuff. Uh, but it is also possible that it's something like the last time, the bug that we had the last time where it was crashing, like numbers behaving differently, like rounding, causing differences in behavior of the system as a whole. Could be the same stuff. There's really there's no way to say without uh, running them in parallel. So the last couple of days I tried to do, I finished this stuff I, in, in in detail. Like it was a matter of updating the schema to include elastic connections, the XML schema, and then basically take the elastic uh, scene that Andre is generating in the C++ version and. Uh, generate uh, one of our files, uh, XML files, and then try to run the scene. And took a couple of days, and then I was able to this, see this weird stuff going on. I'll make a video of the behavior, so in, in case someone has any ideas, in particular, Andre and Sergey might, might have clues with regards as to what uh, is going on, as in why doesn't the elastic matter stay uh, together. Um, and stuff like that. So I will I will make a video of that stuff. I'll try to gather some feedback. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm happy with the amount of work that I put in. It's just that uh, unfortunately, it's a it's an odyssey. Um, but uh, yeah, even with the exploding, is it possible to um, is it possible to see the the demo run? Um, in the current version, like if we rebuild the uh, Geppetto package and uh, and see it explode. Yeah. Well, yeah. The only complication to that is that um, the file is big, so when you run it, it will try to download it off Dropbox, and uh, it's a, it's a really impractical because it's it's a 14 megabytes file. So one of the tasks uh, that I'm adding is to get rid of the XML schema and XML format, and basically have a JSON-based thing that is much, much, much less verbose. So it could go down uh, to one or two megabytes. In that case, uh, it's it's reasonable for folks to download it on the fly. Uh, basically, that that is a complication that will prevent you from. But but I can use a very small file uh, for the demo and uh, like a couple of hundred uh, kilobytes, so that can be used for the demo. It's just stuff moving around that can be used. Fourteen one four megabytes or four point four zero. The the full the the, the same scene that uh, the guys are running on the C plus plus version is fourteen megabytes in the XML file. And see, what up? Put it under revision control though. Thing. What? We can put it under revision control. We can put it in in GitHub so that when you get the package, right, it could like be in the jar. Uh, yeah. The, the problem is that um, the front end will, will will look for a URL. So you, you would have to configure that URL to be a local path, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have anything in place to do that. Okay. At the moment, it's it's uh, you, you're configuring. The config you're you're saying where the configuration file is, and then in the configuration file it will point to the file with the data, yeah. and uh, you would have to change that configuration file, which is the same for everybody. Basically, the change that we need to make is that make those files local instead of having them on Dropbox, which was a feature, but is now becoming an encumberment. Um, so yeah, that stuff will change probably. But uh, I want to make the files smaller. But I mean, my, my focus now is to understand why it doesn't work as it's supposed to, as compared to fixing all those other small things around. Can you run it right now? Or is it on no, I'm on the wrong machine. But I will make a video and I'll post it on the list. OK, cool. Well, um, 
even though I'm sure that you would prefer that it didn't blow up, it's still <laughs> an awesome progress to have gotten it ported and got it working to the extent that it does, and uh, obviously... It doesn't it. crash. That's all the... That's a result as well. <laughs> sure. After, sure after three Andre, months and a half. Yeah, I'm sure Andre and Sergey can relate to the feeling of yeah. crossing the milestone and then uh, finding a bug that uh, stop the progress. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, do we need to... What, what kind of next steps... I saw that you created a new issue for that. Um, yeah. I just I just have to get the original to run and run them side by side and just compare the numbers. I, that's the only way to, to do it. I mean, the way to do it, uh, but like a priori, would be to have tests so that when I was porting it, I could run the tests uh, while I was implementing importing changes. So so basically. You 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 port a, a, a part of the program and 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 you can test it with, with unit tests. So at the end, all the tests are passing. You know it works. While in this case, at the end, uh, kind of hoping that it works and it doesn't, and you don't know where in the process what went wrong at what point. So basically, it's a it's it's a, it's a needle in a stuck uh, situation now. While with a bunch of tests, it could have been that I, I know that the particular test is failing, so I more or less know where to look. While at the moment, there's really no other way other than systematically, line by line, like look at the execution steps and, and compare the buffers and the numbers. And, oh, the numbers are different from this point on, so something must be going wrong around the year. And then look at that, and, and that's the only way you can do it. At, at the moment, and my, my hope is that once we get to like this is still progress because now we have a platform to work on that like, we can actually do this comparison. Once we understand uh, what's wrong, I'm hoping to have a better idea also how to put together a bunch of tests that not only tests test that is not crashing but also test that uh, it's doing good stuff <laughs> and valid valid stuff so that. In future, if we change stuff, it will, it will, it will break the tests, um, which is the way that you should do it. Uh, but sometimes, for lack of time, it, it doesn't work that way. Well, yeah. So let's try to learn from this and do yeah. that. Cool. Well, congrats though for getting a, that working working. Yeah. I'm excited to download yeah. it uh, <laughs> and uh, see it explode anyway. <laughs> Cool. It's fairly slow. Another problem is performance. It's fairly slow, and I'm in touch with Olivier for the Java CLI. It, it looks like all the so, for example, 95% uh, of the execution time of a given step is given by reading values out of the GPU or CPU or device. Yeah. So that shouldn't be happening. So because basically the computation is really fast. It takes uh, maybe 100 milliseconds in total, and then it takes a lot, a lot of time just to read the values out, which is uh, not supposed to be that way. Because if that was the case, it would be a slow on the C++ version as well. So it's not a question of Java versus C++. It's the particular implementation of the bindings. Something weird is going on when it reads the values out. I just don't know what it is because it's a, it's a library we are using. I'm working with the guy who developed the library, uh, obviously. It takes a while to get back and stuff, so I don't know how, how fast that's gonna get sorted. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we continue on. Um, anyway, we're hitting the milestone for this integration, so um, that's great. Let, let's keep going. Um, let's go ahead to Mike. Okay, <clears throat> so as I think most of you have have most of you seen the video of the integrated PCI SPH, the contractive PCI SPH, and the Hodgkin Huxley model. Yes. So I should say apologies for the atrocious um, video video quality. Um, so 
Really, we were expecting Steven Spielberg, Mike. Uh, <laughs> so the the problem is, I didn't find a way to render the render the um, plot the membrane potential and run the uh, integrated run the integrated model together. So what I did was I ran the integrated model, contracted, then I animated the potential separately, um, filmed them, then combined them, and then I realized that in the animation part of it were running faster than than in other parts, and so I had to like speed up and slow down, and the whole thing was the whole thing was a nightmare. It actually took me longer than actually getting the integration to work. Um, but I will. That's uh, often the case. I will focus on trying to make the videos nicer. But essentially, let me um, let me um, try and explain sort of roughly how it works. So um, so okay, if I just point you to this line in <clears throat> in GitHub. So basically so basically um I made a very very simple boring uh, Hodgkin Huxley sodium potassium model because I don't care so much right now about the actual muscle dynamics. I just want to see something spiking affecting a contraction. And then I said okay, let me um write a couple of differential equations. Um I called one an addition rate and one a reduction rate. And these contribute to the contraction, and they're dependent on the membrane potential. <clears throat> um, the the net of the net effect of these two differential equations, when they're coupled together, is that if the if the um, muscle is spiking a lot, then the contraction rate increases, and so contraction increases. And if if not, then the the um, what's called what's it what did I call it the calcium removal rate I think that increases and the uh, contraction instruction decreases so basically okay so <clears throat> it, it's a bit it's a bit I suppose a bit confusing because I, I haven't explained it very clearly but essentially I wrote a Python model and every and uh, I wrote a class which when it's run returns a number and that number is an instruction to the is, is a scalar value which is an instruction to, P, to the PCI SPH telling it how much the muscle should contract by okay um, the differential equations I use themselves are just sort of top of my head I didn't think about them very much I just basically looked for something which increases when the muscle is spiking a lot and decreases when the muscle isn't spiking decreases down to zero and increases uh, ten, uh, Tends to one, so there's a an asymptote at zero and there's an asymptote at one for the function itself. Okay, that's that's uh, so that's sorted. Um, the integration on the C plus plus side, I'll just point you to to the line if I can find it. Okay, if you follow if you follow this link which I've just posted, line one hundred four. So essentially, in the C++ code, uh, Andre has placed this muscle activation variable, which is an instruction to the fluid on how much it must, how much it ought to con contract. And what I've done is replaced it by this simulation dot run method. Now, simulation is an object which is actually which can actually control the Python interpreter. And earlier on in this code, um, simulation the simulation object is created. It imports uh, imports any imports the relevant Python script in the folder. And if there's uh, and it imports a certain class, I can't remember the name. It looks for a Python module, imports a class, and then there's this run method. Which is exposed to the C++ code, and every time this run method is executed, the neural simulation advances. Well, the electrophysiology simulation advances a little bit and returns this contraction value. Okay, so um, please, by the way, stop me if if uh, if you're not understanding anything. It's a, it's a little bit hard to explain, but essentially, if you provide 
if you place any Python script called main.py in the folder in the same folder as the uh, the C plus the C plus plus implementation source code, and you in that Python module you provide a class named muscle simulation, and that class muscle simulation has a run method, then this run method can be is immediately exposed to the C++ version and so you can really have any kind of simulation you want as long as you can interface it this way with a Python script. Does that make sense? Yes. As, okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay, so um, so yeah, so I then wrote a, wrote a simulation in Neuron which after f f does nothing for 1500 milliseconds after 1500 milliseconds injects mm, uh, 5 nanoamps i think of current into the compartment the compartment starts spiking um starts spiking and returns its contraction value every time it's asked for by the every time the c++ um implementation of the sph asks for it so sph runs Asks the Python asks the neuron simulation for the contraction value. Neuron simulation returns the contraction value. SPH runs a bit more, invokes the Python simulation again, and the two go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They're integrated. 1500 milliseconds. Current gets injected. The neuron starts spiking. Contraction value is increased. The simulation contracts, and then after the at 2000 milliseconds, when the current stops being injected. Action potential, action potential stop, and the contraction value returned from the Python script gradually drops down. It's all, it's all quite, quite uh, intuitive, really. The nice thing about this solution is that really you can write any, any simulation you want as long as it's written in Python, or as long, yeah, as long as it's written in Python, it will immediately, easily interface to the contractive SPH simulation. So, I'll try and make some nicer videos. Any questions? That's awesome. Um, I should say I think this is quite cool because, to my knowledge, this isn't something that has been done before. This kind of integration of fluid mechanics and um, electrophysiology. Do you know, Podrick, if you know anything like this has been done? I think the only other place it would have been done um, that I is, is, is in uh, cardiac modeling. Heart model. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a place where they'd have mechanics and they also have physiology of, of um, muscle cells, uh, electrical uh, conductance. Mm -hmm. But uh, not so much in, in neuroscience that I know of. Have you looked at the uh, clones, um, the SOFA implementation that um, Netta Cohen was looking at using? Uh, integrating Brian and I think it's SOFA is a uh, physical modeling, the bio, biomedical physical modeling package. Um, I don't know if they were incorporating um, uh, actual modeling actual muscles there, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll look up the link and um, send it around. Awesome. Okay, that that would be really interesting. But but yeah, I think we've developed some really interesting novel, t to my knowledge at least, novel. Uh, are quite a novel modeling technique here, and uh, we shouldn't underestimate. I think this, I, I think this is one of the first actual, real scientific, scientific uh, steps forward that we've made as part of the part of the project. So, uh, needs some tidying up, obviously. But uh, yeah, uh, me and Andrea are meeting tomorrow to discuss uh, ways forward, things we need to. Things we need to tidy up. Obviously, there's 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 a lot of there's still a lot of loose ends, but we'll I'll, I'll, we'll, that, we'll post to the discussion list once we've once we've had a discussion about the actual technical technical sides because me and Andrew haven't even yet discussed exactly how I did the things I did. So, but yeah, um, I think I actually think like someone brought up cardiac modeling. I think cardiac modeling is actually an area where this 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 technique could be. Really interesting. I think there's a lot of scope for research actually in this. Yeah, definitely. And I think the other thing too is that um, 
we also are, I think, farther ahead on the open, the open source, the open integration of, of this, uh, these frameworks, farther than I don't know that there are any open cardiac computational communities at all. Um, I think a lot of the code, again, is sort of uh, things that get published in papers but don't, um, don't really get turned into libraries that are reusable um, or that are thought about, that reuse isn't mm. thought about. So um, I think that's another extra selling point to what we're, what we're doing yeah. here. And, and so anyway, this is, this is basically what we promised for uh, CNS, right, uh, for the CNS poster um, to do? Yes, yes, it's been done um, ahead of time. Which is nice, <laughs> which is highly unusual. Usu things are usually done much later than they're promised. But we've, we've, this is it's April, and the CNS is in July. So yeah, very very unusual scientific is, is progress. There, is there a chance we can um, you guys can can present this at uh, neuroinformatics as well under a different angle? <laughs> Just thinking of ways to submit an abstract for open work. Um, not me. I've got. I've got actual. You've got a, lot of, stuff. a lot. Of, a, a lot of work on cortical cells that needs doing. So not me. That's fair. We'll find. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll figure that out. But uh, anyway, this is great. And I, you know, if it's if it uh, progresses beyond this um, on the way to April, it, it can be even more exciting and sort of make an even bigger splash. Um, but even this much is um, has, is a great success. So. Um, bravo! I, uh, I so I look forward to tr to trying to download it and play with it myself. Um, it's I think if you have if you have um, if you're using Linux at least, it will be actually quite easy to do. So, okay, I'll provide some instructions for Linux. Cool, that would be good. All right, that's awesome, Mike. Um, I think that's great. Is there anything else uh, that you wanted to talk about? If we have time, can we mention the Psi elegance? I, I call it Psi elegance because it's a bit easier to understand sure. <laughs> what we're talking about. The, you know, the, the Italian-Irish project? Yeah, yeah. Which uh, that's, I thought that was um, pretty, I think that's pretty interesting what they're doing. I, I think you saw I had some questions yeah. out of interest and um, if... Uh, like basically what I brought up in the in the, in the <clears throat> mailing list, I think there's a great opportunity. I, I don't think any of us really the guy, the guy addressed the question of oh is this competition or not. I don't think any of us really were too concerned about that. That I did that didn't really occur to me. There's certainly enough work to be done in this area that that it would take a lot of people in it for for there to become real competition. I think um, once we once we start, you know, we've we've already made some real progress on the body modeling, and if these guys are modeling the neural network using FPGAs, then I think there's a real nice scope for a second, sort of third layer of integration there, integrating their their FPGA-based neural network with the muscle. Um, with the muscular system of the worm, I guess one thing that I don't quite understand, which I asked him, but maybe someone here, I, I feel like, I feel maybe maybe this is a silly question because it's not my area, but I don't, I didn't really understand why the approach they're taking of um, having one, each neur one neuron represented by an FPGA, why that's a clever thing to do, as opposed to some other hardware implementation, you mean, or as opposed to as as a, a, why do you need? I don't understand why need any hardware implementation when it's only 302 neurons. It, it doesn't... Uh, Podrick is shaking his head. Or... I don't... I, the, th the point is I don't know much about FPGA, so if someone does, perhaps I could... I think the concept uh, of, of many of these hardware initiatives, although I, will, I won't say this one specifically, but the, the concept is that um, it's more efficient for calculating neural networks. You can do a hardware implementation. Because think about um, if you use a general CPU to do it, the CPU is doing mathematical calculations. It's solving systems of linear equations every time step. Um, and the idea is the same way that your graphics card implements you know, um, the graphics processing algorithm more efficiently in, in hardware. The idea is just to take that from a level where it's basically you're emulating, if you will, the, you know, the equations on CPU and turning it into 
um, a hardware implementation where the chip just directly calculates everything that you want it to calculate with far fewer um, steps, far fewer steps uh, every clock cycle. So I think the concept is just to um, to have that sped up. And then I think the idea of doing it, even if though there's only 302, is probably inspired by the same thing that we're looking at, which is that um, you could do more detailed uh, you could do more detailed implementations in your FPGAs per neuron than you would if you're trying to do hundreds of thousands, at least as a place to start. Um, so I, I imagine that's the idea. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I guess um, something that maybe they're, they're assuming, which isn't necessarily true, is um, what we're not assuming is is that the neural network is independent of the of the body that there's no feedback or or, or that there's sufficiently little feedback that you could still uh, make simulations of there's people who think that the muscles have stretch receptors which have huge feedback back in, into the neural system and that's vital to how the worm moves and obviously if you only simulate a neural network then it might it might be difficult to obtain meaningful results if that is indeed the case exactly. and i don't know if they've thought about this or not yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll have to ask them about that. I think that though you're right, um, and papers that we've seen really we've seen recently in the last few months suggest also that the motor neurons have stretch receptors, uh, right? So this paper here, or this actually isn't the paper. This is the this is a link to the uh, sort of um, uh, easily accessible scientific explanation of the real paper. But um, this paper strongly suggests, and we were talking with the first author of it um, a few weeks back um, from Harvard, that the motor neurons directly respond to the level of flex and bend mm. of, of the body. So um, I don't know that their hardware implementation is intended to capture you know, all the physics that we're trying to do. So I think to some extent we are, we are trying to capture a superset of, of uh, simulated activity uh, compared to them, but so I, I think their main focus is on neurons that are more biological and implementing them in hardware, which is yeah. great too. Um, I've imagined, uh, you know, some point down the future when we have all the software algorithms worked out correctly, to have these all implemented, all of all of them implemented in in a chip. So imagine that you could um, have a PCI SBH chip, and uh, it would talk to the the neuron processing chip. And you know the diffusion stuff would be another chip, and you could actually have a device that would mm -hmm. simulate this far, far faster than you would with you know five computers that are all all all, all put together. Um, in my view, though, I think we have a lot more to go before we could build such a device. Yep. We have to do all the correctness uh, and, and all the data integration and all the all the, all the parameter tuning um, before defining the, the model. But um, that would be pretty cool to have, like, um, like a brain coprocessor, if you will, or a neural network coprocessor you can plug into a USB or something. Uh, it's science fiction. Yeah. So with Arduinos, with Arduinos, you know, it starts to become a little bit more conceivable, like a bunch of Arduino boards plugged together, or, or the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you know, you start to think about the open source hardware community, which, uh, by the way, I hope that we get them to do we can get convince them to work with open source things like those. Um, actually, that's a good thing. I should point them out. But uh, yeah. Uh, also, the um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one one thing that I find uh, uh, nice about the one of PGA per neuron is that you come up, you basically end up with an architecture that has a very similar concept to the actual real thing. As in, uh, it, it's very, it's a black box approach where I suppose the set of input and outputs that you would have for each one of those modules would be independent from the other. So it's just like in terms of putting more of different things and interconnecting them, but where the individual neuron is basically independently modeled and self-contained into an FPGA, mm. I think that is actually cool. No, it's interesting. It's just that if, if, if in the real worm the muscles also have strong electrophysiological feedback uh, properties which feed back into this network, then actually you don't need 302 FPGAs, you need several hundred more. Yeah, you might, uh, well, let's say that if you have one FPGA per each cell, let's say that you end up 
with uh, yeah. a thousand FPGAs, but that's really okay. then you can actually physically break one and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. So you might need more than three hundred and two or so than that. Yeah, yeah, if you want to go beyond, yes. I think that's it for me. Great. Um, so did, did this involve LibNRML refactoring, by the way? Uh, I see no note about that. Not, uh, oh, um, <clears throat> in the end, because I really wanted to get it done, um, there were still some, some parameter things I needed to sort out. In the end, I just wrote, did, did it in Neuron. So the point is, the, the way I've approached this is such that you can really as long as you can write a simulation in Python, it's completely independent of, of what you do. So um, I've made libnirml refactoring is pretty much complete now. I'm working on pyramidal refactoring, which is a slightly different beast. Uh, but no, no, I'm not using pyramidal in this simulation. I, I will for for the for the actual muscle cell because I'm not even using our in our, our own uh, optimized muscle cell. I'm really just going for the simplest simulation I could find, just the classic Hodgkin Huxley simulation. I just wanted to prove the principle. So, to answer your question, no. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on to Porig. Um, what's new, sir? I think you're muted. Not a whole lot on the um, uh, open worm front, I'm afraid. I did, I think, send a mail about the uh, JNeuroML, which is the kind of tool which bundles everything we're doing for Lens and NeuroML2 in Java packages together into one um, jar file and tries to make it easier to um, run the import and export functions there. So, um, the muscle cell model for uh, which had been partially converted from uh, Boyle, uh, I believe, has been updated to the latest version of NeuroML2 and can be run in LEMS with uh, JNeuroML, which hopefully makes it a little bit easier for other people to run it. And uh, so, but it's still not correct. Um, but hopefully, uh, this way of distributing LEMS and NeuroML will make it easier for people to test, to validate, and to convert different types of NeuroML models and, for example, get SBML in imported into uh, LEMS and running Neuron and various things like this. OK, great. Uh, um, the other main thing that's been going on is uh, Mateo's updated the website. And so I think we showed you a version of that which was hosted elsewhere. but. Uh, the open source uh, brain website has been updated and looks very nice. And uh, we've got a little bit more acti activity there. A few more people have signed up and some new projects and came onto it first time this morning and um, looked at uh, the list of projects. And there were two brand new projects, which we didn't actually add ourselves, uh, by people who now can go on there and add it themselves without uh, just pointing at a GitHub repository without uh, interacting with us. So hopefully that will encourage more people to come along and um, uh, sign up and share their projects on there. So for example, the olfactory bulb uh, model is one that um, uh, Hoopy Ballas Group is going to be developing, which is originally in Moose, uh, but uses elements in NeuroML. And we want to try to get it on there and get it working with as many simulators as possible. Awesome. Congratulations. This is looking great. Uh, OK. And uh, yeah, so we've been plugging this to the INCF as well. So hopefully, um, we get a little bit more activity from people who are not directly involved in building simulators, but just want to try to share their models and uh, find other models and do various other things. Cool. Some stuff. All right. Uh, let's keep going. So actually, uh, Andre, uh, would you mind uh, signing up to Open Source Brain as well? Because if you go on to the About uh, tag on Open Source Brain, we have uh, flag or locations of various people around the world who've uh, been signed up to the um, initiative. And we would like to have one right in the middle of Siberia, if that's OK. 
I'll be glad to just okay. um, if you will send the link, it will be easier for me. Okay, sure, no problem. Um, and I think I don't have any other updates. Oh, but I see. Oh, yes. Thanks. Yes, so you can probably just click on the um, link for sign up. missing Sergey today. Um, so we'll go on to Tim. Uh, saw an update from you as well. Um, uh, and you're not there in the room, I can see. So, <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll leave him to the end. I think he's, uh, he's, he's uh, multitasking. Um, so we'll put him towards the end. OK, so Andre, uh, how are you, sir? What's new? Oh, everything is fine, thanks. Um, so, today I will try to tell about uh, the problems we still have in our simulation. I will try to share my screen. Okay, let's start with this one. So it shows um, the um, evolution of uh, center of mass of a single elastic object. Uh, so it's like a um, box composed of elastic particles. Um, exactly the same. Um, as uh, was shown on uh, the, the video uh, which uh, Mike recently shared. Um, so uh, it can uh, contract. Um, if we press um, a button in the simulation. Um, Wait, hang on. What's the, sorry, what's the y axis? Um, sorry. What's What's the, the y axis? Uh, this uh, vertical. Okay. Uh, the, the curve which uh, usually uh, has a value of zero uh, is uh, muscle activity. So there are three spikes um, which correspond to times when I pressed uh, the key on the keyboard. Mm. Okay. It's. Uh, well, each spike um, corresponds to time interval, um, which is enough uh, for a muscle um, to contract uh, completely. And then there is a period of uh, relaxation. But um, in the simulation, which corresponds to this um, graphic, um, almost everything except elastic uh, interactions is switched off. No gravity, no uh, liquid uh, interactions, uh, no uh, spring damping, uh, only uh, elastic uh, sedations. I have switched off everything to yeah. first to find out uh, the reason of the problems, and uh, secondly to show uh, that possibly um, we localized the problem, but don't know right now how to solve. So, uh, uh, red, green, and blue uh, curves um, correspond to uh, x, y, and z uh, coordinates of center of mass of elastic matter. Uh, it's uh, totally constant and keeps constant until we press uh, uh, keyboard and activate uh, muscle contraction. So after this. Um, Something happens, uh, except uh, the contraction which we uh, can observe, uh, which causes uh, elastic body to move uh, as a whole object uh, somewhere. Well, 
we can also observe uh, some bending, some sinusoidal uh, oscillations in which arise, uh, which begin after some time after relax after muscle contraction. And well, we can explain it, of course. Um, we have no uh, damping of oscillations, so everything can happen except uh, moving of uh, center of mass. It should keep constant if uh, everything is correct in uh, physics calculations. And this is the thing which I currently cannot understand. Uh, maybe add, the, uh, real quick. So the yellow line and the let's see, yellow, the red, and the blue lines. Those are just uh, center of mass of different particles in. It's green. It's a green line. Matter. Sorry, green looks yellow to me. Um, is that right? These are these are these four lines are four different. The center of mass of four different particles. No, no, no. <coughs> uh, there is uh, on, only one uh, center of mass. Uh, center of mass of uh, uh, of elastic body as a whole. Uh, so if you have, uh, for example, 300 particles in this composing this uh, elastic body, uh, then we make a summation over all of them and have x, y, and z uh, coordinates, which correspond to these three uh, curves. Ah, okay. Yes. So, if the x, y, and z each each mark differently, okay. Um, and the blue and the one where it's just a deflection is what? Just a displacement? Yes. Displacement. So every every time we um, make additional uh, muscle activation, uh, we get. Uh, additional uh, error in the system. So additional uh, movement of uh, center of mass. Okay. So, so why is this, so what you what you are expecting is that um, the particle only moves, um, the center of mass only moves, the center of mass of the whole tissue only moves when you hit the key and then should return back to the position that it was at to you to expect and Instead of these lines flying off like this, you expect them to, to eventually come back uh, to the center. Is that what you're? Looking they should for? be. No, no, they should be constant. Mm -hmm. uh, be completely flat. If there's no yes. interaction with the environment, <clears throat> then the center of mass should stay exactly the same because it's not exerting forces on the environment. Is that correct, Andre? Completely right. So if we are in space and um, mm -hmm. there is some object, uh, we can. Um, force it to move only by uh, pushing something uh, <coughs> aside from it, like uh, all space uh, engines do. Uh, so the fuel is... Uh, um, okay. Yeah, it violates the first law. Yeah. Yes, yes, right. So first law here is um, doesn't work. And uh, I should uh, find why and fix it. Andre, yes. I have a. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. So, in this system, is the object? It's sitting on. Is it still sitting on some boundary particles, or is it floating? It, it's floating. Uh, I will it's try floating. to show you, show the system. Um, Well, when uh, I press uh, share the screen, I don't see the window <laughs> which oh. contains the simulation. Uh, I don't right. know why. Just try share desktop. It's the first option. Okay. Maybe this will work. Okay, okay. here it is. So. Uh, it's completely the same uh, system, but mm -hmm. which was in that example uh, on GitHub. Uh, 
um, but due to no gravity, it doesn't fall, and it, it is it keeps uh, floating on the center of the simulation. Okay. So I, I, I can try to uh, activate and show uh, one of the processes which is uh, shown on that uh, graphic which I showed before. So everything uh, looks not so bad. Yeah. Um, but but in general, um, the first law is already um, broken here. So we have some small uh, drift of the system as a whole. And if we make additional uh, contractions, we will see. Um, oscillations in another directions, not in that which we forced by uh, muscle activation. Hmm. So you start, to, so at the moment the direction of contraction is just in X? Yes. And you will eventually and start to see contraction oscillations in Y and Z which are due to the... Yes, we will see them, uh, we will see them very soon. Um, by the way, if I make uh, elastic body uh, only one particle uh, wide, so here is uh, one, two, three, five particles. Uh, if I make only one layer instead, uh, then they never become This become become such behavior uh, like mm. bending and so on. So, no, no, we can observe uh, that. It's, even though, so even that though it's wrong, I think we all think it's still pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's but it, but but it's doing something wrong. No, no it's sure. dancing. We need, we need <laughs> to fix it, but it's it still looks pretty. Yeah, it wants to be a worm. It wants to be a worm. <laughs> <laughs> could this this is not evolved. It definitely wants to grow up to be a worm, for sure. Yeah. So, not only uh, such oscillations, but um, a drift of center of mass uh, also. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a couple of ready questions that I have for you. Um, I don't know. I don't think we want to go into them too deeply right now. Actually, now I'm kind of wishing I, I had the time to attend this next thing that you've set up with, with Mike. But, I mean, one thing is, like, have you considered the... Um, uh, level of precision uh, that's necessary here in terms of how many decimal places we need to uh, have in our floating point uh, calculations in order to because I mean one thing would be that uh, potentially we're updating uh, we're updating at time steps too slowly to really capture this and um, so the forces are uh, being applied um, kind of. I don't know. Th there's momentum that's carrying it forward, or something, and that um, we're s we're slicing time too coarsely, so it's going to start adding up to a bunch of uh, imprecisions throughout the entire system. Do you, have you have you tried to look ca calculate out like how many um, how many decimal places we should have in our floating point numbers uh, to capture the the full precision of this? Well, I think that uh, precision is quite enough, but the problem happens uh, when we introduce, um, when we activate muscle contractions. Uh, I think uh, that something is wrong with the um, model of uh, application and calculation of uh, forces, the external forces. Um, okay. So. Um, well, maybe, maybe we have some problem uh, with um, integration of um, right. equations of movements, which is not uh, visible uh, for um, all other processes, uh, but with, but something is, something goes uh, in another way uh, when we um, apply such forces like uh, contraction. 
Well, I can't explain it uh, right now, but I have some thoughts about how to find out what's going on. Well, by the way, we, we don't have um, such problems if you have a very extremely simple uh, system of two uh, point masses and one spring. It behaves correctly. Hmm. And when we uh, add more uh, particles and more springs, uh, this becomes. So I will. Yeah. Keep the thing. It's going like going fixing this. <laughs> that's why. That's why I think you know we just need to look at how we're doing the numerical integration. I know that there's a lot of work on different ways, strategies of doing numerical integration. Some of it has to do with precision. Others just have to do with the technique. It looks like it could be the kind of thing where it only happens at the end of a very long string of decimals that there's some little tiny error that creeps in, but then because obviously this thing propagates in time, then it knocks into the other particles and then it adds up and adds up and adds up and mm -hmm. uh, and then you get you get that behavior. So that's I don't know that that's why I thought about that um, because I assume that you're built the tissue in a symmetric way and that you're applying forces in a symmetric way. With an algorithm that just right. uh, over all of it, right? So Symmetry that's doesn't a whole bit of code in terms of the application of the forces mm. to bug. Symmetry shouldn't even matter anyway. Even it would, <clears throat> the center of mass should not move, even if the particle, if, even if the object was non-symmetrical. Well, no, but the, right. if, if the forces are being no, because there's no application to when it. If, if, if all the forces are internal forces, then the center of mass cannot move, otherwise it would vi violate Newtonian laws of mechanics. Um, For sh definitely. <laughs> Either way, it sounds uh, like a good uh, opportunity to yeah, start yeah. setting up tests, because it's a very atomic uh, testable thing. That when you have, uh, it's a very easy to set up a scene that you always run, uh, and then if in future, like when we get to fix it, and in future we break it again, we would know even without the visual observation of the weird mm. stuff that goes on. Like it would be nice to to start building a, a battery of these tests based on yep. these r real issues that we are facing. Yeah, center of mass violation is a very good unit test, I think. Center of mass movement. Uh, so, so this is yeah. essentially conservation of momentum. It is. It, it should <coughs> well, be it uh, like a, system. for the whole system, right? Mm -hmm. Even when you put in liquid, it's just even more difficult to understand what's wrong. But it should be conserved for the whole, for the thing, for the system as a whole, right? Yeah. 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 So that would, would be a, a nice test. Like you, you can you can have like random scenes, and it should it should always do that. Um, I would personally be a little bit surprised if it was numerical error causing right. this. Why? Mm. Just intuition, but no no real other reasons than that. But um, my my gut feel, but. Obviously, you can't just go with gut feel. But if 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 I was under, it wouldn't be the first place I would look, just because okay. purely because the the effect appears to come about so rapidly. Um, and if it was numerical error, I would expect it to happen with extremely simple systems as well, with observable. There might be something else going on. Also, if it was numerical error, I, it, I wouldn't expect it to be caused only with the contraction. So, but it could be. But my my gut feel is. Is that it's not it won't turn out to be that. Okay. Well, um, just some thoughts. So um, we can dig into it more. But now it's a mystery, and uh, so we'll, uh, we'll. I'll be curious to see what the answer is. Um, is there anything we can do to help, Andre? Well, I think I will finally find out what happens. Um, quite enough uh, time. Uh, already spent uh, all this, but well, um, there are um, well, there is uh, 
quite a big mystery um, in this worm. We are going to experiment <laughs> to um, solve, um, but um, all the preliminary uh, tasks uh, and technologies we are um, developing uh, are also have a tendency to give us small uh, mysteries uh, to find out. Uh, what's ha what happens and slows down um, all the research. But I should say, actually, to connect this back to the manuscript that you're writing up for SBH, um, actually, this test that Giovanni just, just mentioned and this graph that you've just presented here, actually, um, make its way into the into the paper once we fix it, because it's, it's a very sensible test. Uh, you know, that you've set up to demonstrate that, in fact, uh, that uh, momentum is conserved. So I think that the reviewers will be happy to see that uh, we've actually gone through this process mm. and we've resolved it. Um, it's a good demonstration that, you know, our algorithm isn't just, uh, just one free, but, uh, is actually correct. So I would, uh, I would even include a little section on that right now. Um, in terms of just writing up like what the test battery is for this, um, so the reviewers will be able to have a look at. It. Make sense? Yes. Um, right, because it goes it goes beyond even just implementing the SPH algorithm. It's like in addition to doing that, we've done this test specifically with elastic matter to to see how it works in this case. So, very cool. Um, right. So, let's see. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Okay. All so right. Tim, Tim is back. Tim is back. Okay, but I've uh, I moved you to the end there, so I'm going to let Matteo uh, yeah. Matteo go first, um, and then we'll go to then we'll go to Tim. So Matteo, uh, hello. Sorry, I couldn't join when the meeting started. Uh, I was actually working on um, the JLAMS implementation, and that is progressing, uh, and uh, it, it is basically the uh, work of putting in place uh, an API for it, and uh, so that. That same API will be using from um, the Geppetto bundle and will integrate it with uh, the everything else. Basically, as soon just to put it into the big into the big picture again, as soon as I'm done with this, we will have a Geppetto bundle leveraging JLAMs that will be able to do single compartment cells. So, for instance, the muscle cell will be able to be simulated there and uh, visualized there. And if in the meanwhile, Joe will fix uh, SPH, which I'm sure he will at some stage, then we'll have the video that Mike shown to us running in Geppetto on the web with all the nice things that we're trying to do. There. So as uh, Andrew was saying earlier, all the things we're building have a bit of mystery, same as the worm. And <laughs> so trying to solve that as we Anything else? Uh, no. Okay. Cool. Um, and Tim. Hey, guys. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Just basically, I, I haven't had a chance to do a whole lot because of uh, I started a new job. So, um, but um, what I have been doing, and as I alluded to in the past, is that the good thing about putting this all into data format is that it tells us and shows us immediately what information we do not have. And so I've been working on that. Um, I've been updating the spreadsheet out on Google Docs uh, to add uh, more information about the, the indexins and uh, neural peptides and receptors, etc. So I'm starting to go through each neuron set now and <clears throat> where we're missing uh, content, trying to start digging that content out and start adding it to the list. Uh, also, I did I did create the brain thing and send it over to you. I don't know uh, who's looked at it or if you guys think it has any value at all. I, I I've never been thrilled about it, so but you know I went ahead and 
did it, and uh, you know, it's up to the group as to what they want to do with it. That's it. Yeah. So I've um, I'm actually just in the background here. I'm I'm checking that into GitHub because I suspect that there is um, there's a way to make the HTML a little bit more portable, and so that I can see it on I can see it on Chrome. Because I opened it up on Dropbox. Uh, if you if you kept up with the email this with the mailing list discussion we had, the problem with Chrome is just that it's loading local files. If that was deployed, it would load the files. It would fetch the files via HTTP and it would work. So it's fine. It's just that Chrome doesn't let you load local files oh. via JavaScript. No, I know, but um, so. The way that we've done this in the past has been not by changing the code, but by um, changing the documentation. So basically, if you um, if you just tell folks to run a, a simple um, Python HTTP server, uh, which is like a one-line Python command, then uh, it'll yeah. even on your local host. Yeah. Then, yes. No. If you if you do it via local host, it will work. That's yeah. fine. So yeah. um, so I'm just. I'm just uh, throwing it into GitHub. Actually. Well, what I was thinking uh, when, when you guys started the discussion is that we the plan was to deploy it somewhere and link it from the website. We could do that, and it yeah, would work. But, yeah, eventually I think we want to do that. I just haven't even seen. I I, I have been not, not been able to personally play with the the version myself because I haven't uh, I haven't done that local server thing yet. Um, okay. But uh, that that is I think the goal. That's the goal of all these database projects is to is to post them. Um, so. And uh, looks like I've actually just gone ahead and put it up right now. Uh, here we go. But yeah, um, let's let's have a look at it. I'm going to see if I can add that documentation this week. Um, and maybe we can go back and forth on on it. Um, right, so there, everybody's uh, benefit. There it is. Um, and so if you want to sync the data viz repo uh, and then try running index.html um, after um, having a Python server up in that directory, I think that should work. I'll update the documentation. Or you open uh, with the browser that is not Chrome. Or Firefox works. Or you start it without that feature. Right? Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, anything else, Tim? No, I'm good. We should probably also post the database dump. Uh, would be the next thing um, to put up under version control. Did you put that on Dropbox? Yeah. Um, yes, I did. Okay. It's under the Steve Cook um, database, I think. I just found it. Still like JSH.SQL. Or C elegans are on metabolites at SQL. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Okay, let's let's have a look. And so that that also looks like a good start. Um, that might be nice too if we can get a, a little web-based client that folks can use to look at it. Um, uh, I know there's a few of those. Like we can load it up in maybe PHP, MySQL admin, or something, um, and get folks. Uh, we can. Post that up somewhere. Mm, might be good. Yeah, and actually, I used that database to create the uh, imp import files to create the brain. So it did, it did okay. come in handy for me. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So you and I should probably get together for next steps on that. Um, maybe next week. Um, how's your schedule? Yeah, I probably. Yeah, we could we can chat offline about it. it, okay. it it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary. All right. That's okay. Good. Um, all right. So uh, other things, I do want to, now that we're at the end here in terms of going around, uh, maybe kick around some ideas for the uh, neuroinformatics abstract. But um, does anybody else have anything you wanted to say? All right. So if we imagine that in July, we're going to have this, um, this PCI SPH muscle cell piece or muscle fiber at right now, hopefully in going into muscle cell at that point, 
um, presented, and and that's at the middle of July. The end of July um, is when this new, excuse me, the end of August, which is about a month and a half afterwards, is uh, neuroinformatics. So um, we have the opportunity to either get a different first author than Mike to try and present similar stuff um, from perhaps a different angle, or focus on progress in some of the other domains that we've been making, perhaps more along a sort of neuromel uh, angle. Um, perhaps also uh, there's analysis of the connectome uh, that I've been doing with, uh, with the high plots, which is another thing that would be straightforward to present um, as pretty, being pretty interesting. That's something that comes to mind. Um, what else? We could present an update on Geppetto. We could present an update on integration with JLEMS. We could present um, any of the um, model optimization parameter stuff, potentially, if Mike's willing to let somebody else take, a, take the lead on it. Uh, we could present some of the data aggregation work that, that Tim has done. Um, Anything um, else that comes to mind? I think that's pretty much everything there is. Uh, I would suggest we, we dump this list into a thread and we, we do it asynchronously. Um, or make I a Google Doc. The, or make a Google Doc and uh, list. We do it the same as we do for everything else. Like, uh, it's probably. As these days go by, maybe other ideas will, will come will come up. But you, you you made a good job to. That's like probably ninety percent of all the possible <laughs> options. So. So who is actually that? who's actually thinking of going to uh, the ICF Congress in? Is it I'm August there. or September? August. That's August. Well, I'll be happy to go. One, uh, but um, let's see. Strange amount of background noise coming from my yeah. Sorry. Um. Okay. Well, fine. That's fine. We'll kick it around via email. Just uh, I just wanted to see if, if folks had other ideas here because we only have like put it together. So um, worst case scenario, I'll volunteer to be first author and I'll, I'll follow something together. But if anybody else wants the opportunity to, have the, to, to drive it, have the first author on it, um, just let me know. OK? OK. Great. All right, everybody. Well, eventful couple weeks. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we'll do it again in two weeks from now, as, unless anybody knows of any conflicts right now. That they'd like to reschedule, so that will be. Um, let's see, let's just put the date. That May will be first, right? May. May day. Yes. So hopefully you can all make it, um, and uh, we'll get the other folks in as well. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.